History of the Middle East with Dr. Borovkin. We continue today with the uh, Fatimid dynasty. We spoke about uh, Hakim, uh, a very important um, uh, caliph, and then his son Zahir. And now we're talking about Mustanzir. So he's the son of Zahir. He reigned from 1035 to 1093. And so that it's easy to remember, remember the crucial date, 1099. This is when the Crusaders come to Jerusalem. So he reigns for most of the 11th century, a big 70 years, long reign uh, from 1035 to 1093, almost to the time of the uh, Crusaders. Now, um, when he was a child, it was a very interesting short period of history when uh, a mother, his mother ruled as a regent. And as far as I recall, this is the first time when a woman actually reigned officially uh, in an Islamic country. She reigned as a, as a mother for his minor uh, child. Uh, and it was about 15 or at least about 15 years that you had a Muslim country that the official head of uh, there were ups and downs. It was a very dramatic, very, very dramatic, full of events uh, reign that on the whole ended up pretty badly for Egypt. And so this is what we will talk about. In the beginning, well, while his mother was reigning, which is 1035 to about 1050, things were okay. Uh, and, and that means the trade was moving, the caravans were coming, the ships were coming, everything was, the crops were there. But then comes, as we discussed last time, when the Nile goes dry, then there is a drought, and that means that there is not enough water, and that means there is famine. And so this is what happened in um, 1058. Uh, you have a series of troubles. In fact, when you list those troubles, it, it could hardly be worse. Uh, if one could imagine what could possibly go wrong, everything went wrong. So it started out with a drought, and that means no water, and that means no food, and that means that the prices for food and for grain uh, went up uh, immensely, and a lot of people couldn't afford it. So what uh, Mustanzir did, he had a um, vizier, and the name of vizier was Al Yasuri, uh, Yasuri, Y A Z U R Y, Yasuri, and he was a good one. He tried to resolve the problem. Uh, by basically fixing the price on grain, which is something modern governments do all the time. Uh, they put controls to avoid speculation and prices rising beyond uh, reasonable levels. Uh, however, the merchants who, uh, con who wanted to sell their stuff, uh, they killed him. They didn't want any price controls. And they killed al Yazuri, and essentially... After that murder, there was chaos. There was no control over prices. There were skyrocketing prices. There was famine. There were brigands. There were gangs of all kinds. They were trying to rob people and shops. And it was like total uh, collapse of uh, governmental authority. Moreover, it led to a rebellion of the troops because the army wasn't paid. And they rebelled. They, they went on pillaging because they had no money to sustain themselves. And the Egyptian army, as a matter of fact, consisted of three parts. Uh, one part was the Berbers, and that was the locals. Uh, these were people from the tribes of the North African coast. Uh, the second part were the Turks, and these were hired army that was, you know, we talked about many rulers began to hire the, uh, the Turks that would begin to come to, that, to, to the Middle East. And the third part were from Sudan, Sudanese. They were black slaves who were just like the Sultan of Morocco. Uh, in the 19th century, the army of the Sultan of Morocco was black slaves. Uh, and so this is the same thing. You had a, a slave army. Theoretically, all of them were slaves uh, of, the, of the Sultan. But in practice, he had to pay them. Uh, and now you had a rebellion in the armies, a mutiny, and the Turks and the Berbers revolt against the Sudanese. And there was a kind of a conflict among the different parts of the army. And 
the Turks and the Berbers chased out the Sudanese and they went down to Sudan and what the source says, they established a bandit kingdom uh, uh, somewhere in Somalia. It reminds us of modern times because even today, Somalia could be called a bandit kingdom. There's no government authority or very limited one. And you have pirates and bandits of all kinds who who do their business on the Indian, Indian Ocean, robbing ships or uh, in the country itself, attacking neighboring countries. So it's, it's a similar situation. But in any case, the point for the history of Egypt is a complete collapse of authority and of state power, famine and devastation. One of the tragic events is that uh, the uh, mobs that were going all around Cairo, they pillaged the library and they put uh, thousands of books. And I think even today there is a, a place in, in Cairo that's called the Hill of Books and they burned them. So they just kind of just destroyed the library they had no use for it. There was no value. You couldn't sell those books, uh, not immediately anyway. So they basically destroyed this library. Uh, they also came to the palace uh, and uh, Mustanzir thought that they were going to kill him, but they didn't. They just kind of left him alone. He sent his family away and the caliph had actually no food. He was hungry. It was absolutely, he had absolutely nothing. He had no, no servants, no family, no power, empty palace. And he just got by with whatever he could procure around uh, for food for himself. Uh, to make things worse, it was a total catastrophe. There was a plague. Uh, so it was an outbreak of this horrible disease and thousands and thousands of people died in the plague. Uh, and Mustazir uh, essentially felt uh, that it would have been better if he died instead of seeing his country going basically down the drain. So all this horror continued for seven years. Uh, but then uh, in 1073, uh, for the first time, there was a normal crop uh, that the drought finished. Uh, and finally, there was the semblance of normal life returning to Egypt. Uh, but Mustanzir still felt that he couldn't control the situation uh, and he asked for help. And this will be extremely important for the further history of Fatimid Egypt. Uh, he knew somebody and his name was Badr and his last name was Gamali. Badr Gamali uh, was in Syria. And he contacted him and asked him to come and help him. So Badr Gamali come and uh, he brought with him Syrian troops. Uh, I don't know how many exactly there were, whether it was in hundreds or in thousands, but he did come uh, with his Syrian uh, troops. And um, he basically announced to the Turks, uh, the future Mamluks, uh, that, uh, that, that he came with peaceful purposes and that uh, he was just going to do the services, uh, you know, to be the servants of uh, Caliph. Uh, and uh, he organized a kind of a friendly party or reception at the palace for the Turkish officers. Uh, and then as the party was going on, they were all murdered. The Turks were. So it was a trick. Badr Kamali tricked them and uh, basically killed them all. And, and the others ran away. And this way he retook the control over the city uh, for uh, Mustanzir. So from that moment on, basically for another 20 years until their death, 20 years later in 1094, uh, they ruled together. Pretty much all of power was in the hands of uh, uh, Badr Gamali, uh, and he was a vizier, uh, but the uh, official caliph was Mustanzir. But they were friends, and it's not like he uh, disobeyed him or anything. They were just pretty much ruled together, in a sense, like uh, one could say that uh, Arun Rashid and his vizier, uh, yeah, he got along pretty well. In any case, uh, these years were um, uh, fairly uh, normal, and there was a semblance of order that returned to Cairo, but of course it was nowhere near 
to what it was before uh, the terrible famine uh, that struck it earlier. Now, another important point is that when um, uh, they both died at, but at the same time, 1094, 19, uh, 93, 94, with a few months difference. So Badr Kamali died and uh, uh, Mustanzir died. And Badr Kamali had a son and his son succeeded him as a, as a caliph. I'm sorry, as, as, as a vizier. So uh, Badr's son became a vizier, just like his father. And his name is Al-Afdal. And he would play a very important role in the future history of Egypt. And since the Crusaders are going to come, he's going to play a role with the Crusaders too. So please remember, Al-Afdal is the son of uh, Badr. And he is also a vizier. And it was he who actually chose the next caliph. And there were two brothers. And one was named Al-Mustali. And the other was Nizar. So two brothers. Uh, and uh, the Nizar was the older brother. And he was supposed to be, by, by the law of succession, he's supposed to be uh, next in line. Moreover, don't forget, it's not just a caliph. This is a Shia uh, caliphate. And that means he's an imam at the same time. Because uh, he continues to be the bloodline of Ali. Uh, and therefore, it's very important that the rules of succession be, uh, be uh, respected. But al Afdal didn't do that, maybe because he was a Syrian and didn't know any of this. Uh, for whatever reason, he chose a younger brother, most likely, as it always happens, because the younger brother is easier to control. So he chose Al-Mustali, and Al-Mustali becomes caliph, and, and he's a child. And therefore, real power is in the hands of Al-Afdal. But Nizar uh, doesn't like what is going on, and he, he rebels. He goes into raising an army, uh, and fighting. Uh, and this is known in history as a Nizar rebellion. And of course, uh, he loses. Nizar loses uh, his uh, battle and he is um, killed in battle. And of course, by the Shia tradition, he is an imam who goes into heaven, into occultation. And it actually, the consequences were much, much more long lasting than simply a quarrel between two brothers. Because there was a sect of uh, uh, Shia that was formed that were called Nizars, uh, and they are the ones that, that are today known as the Seveners. So there are two branches of, of uh, Shia, the Twelvers and the Seveners. Well, Nizar is the Sevener. He was the seventh Imam in the role uh, of Caliphs, of Imams from Ali on, and he had to be, by law of succession, the rightful chosen one. Well, he wasn't, and he was killed. And that means he went into occultation, and that means he became divine from the point of view of the Shia. And this is the origin of this uh, branch of uh, Shia Islam that are called the Seveners. Moreover, he had even more drastic consequences. There was a sub-branch of the Seveners who are known as, in history as the Assassins. Uh, and the Assassins were an organization, uh, they was a secret religious organization uh, that actually uh, felt that they are the sword of Islam. And, and they did do assassinations, yes. They, uh, they were mostly based in Iran. They had a whole bunch of fortresses uh, that were quite hard to get to. They were secret organization, they had, they had money, they had support. They, they were quite powerful because they did act uh, in ways that that were quite terrifying. They would, you know, put a, a dagger next to somebody's bed. Uh, and that was a sign that, that unless he changes uh, his behavior, he'll be killed. They would mostly, mostly they would kill uh, who they considered enemies of Shia Islam. Uh, and they were indeed a medieval terrorist organization the Assassins. Fascinating story, which could be researched and, and told you in a separate time, but it is a fascinating period. In any case, um, so this is the origin of uh, Ismaili community. Now, a little bit more about Al-Mustali. 
because it is in the reign of Al Mustali and when he was still a child that Al Afdal has to face Crusaders. Uh, 1099, the Crusaders do arrive to the Middle East, and I will tell you in a separate lecture the story of their arrival. But the point from the Egyptian point of view is that they do come and they do take Jerusalem uh, in 1099, which begins an almost a century of uh, uh, Jerusalem being in the hands uh, of uh, Crusaders and the entire coast from Tyre to Egypt, uh, today's Lebanon, Israel uh, and Syria, all of that uh, is the uh, several kingdoms of Crusaders, of the European, the Franks as they were called, or Crusaders. They, they were French and German and Italian and English. Uh, they do come and they seize Jerusalem and al Afdal has to face this new reality uh, that the Europeans are here. Uh, and he would not do a very good job, and, but that we should discuss later. Uh, there's a new situation in the Middle East. There's new states. So let's go over the states. In Egypt, you have, uh, you have uh, Fatimid Egypt for another close to 70 years. Then the entire coast of the Mediterranean is the uh, Crusader kingdoms, the kingdom of Jerusalem, and then of Tyre and Sidon and and. and um, Acre, and then further coast in Syria and uh, connection to Asia Minor. All of that is, is occupied by the uh, Crusaders who have their uh, kingdoms, but they're all united into one Crusader force. Now, in Syria, very interestingly, you do not have, uh, it is not a, a, a Baghdad rule of the Caliph, no. Syria is taken over by the, what are known as Seljuk Turks. So these are the Turks, uh, and they take power and create their own fiefdom, so kingdom, uh, with the capital obviously in Damascus. So these are the Turks. And then further north, there are smaller other ones. Uh, there's Mazul. In other words, there's a splintered community. In Baghdad, there's a ruler. In Mazul, there's a ruler. In um, in, in, in Syria, there's a ruler. It's essentially, Middle East is a kind of a mosaic of small, tiny principalities, and most of them are Muslim, but then even the Muslims are different between the Shia and, and the uh, Sunni, so it's completely splintered up, and that makes it easier for the Crusaders come and establish a foothold in the uh, Middle East. Okay, thank you. Don't forget to put likes in your video and to subscribe. <laughs>